fourth webinar in our UK Deaf Leadership Summit series. So if you're new to the event, maybe it's your first time, we know that you'll be really inspired by what we have to offer today. Also, welcome back, those of you who have been with us before, especially those people who've been coming to every single event and really following every event. Congrats and thank you all. So the speaker today, it's really, she'll be sharing something completely different uh, with you all. Our previous webinars, the speakers have been very focused on sharing their views on leadership from more of their personal career experience. But today you're gonna to be hearing from someone who's made their career really in management and leadership education. So our speaker today, she'll be doing a presentation talking about her, her, she has a lot of experience in commentating on television and radio. She does a weekly podcast. She's also a Forbes blogger, also a columnist for different industry magazines, and very regularly, a very frequent speaker at different conferences around the UK and abroad. Her topics that she uh, does a presentation on really focus around leadership and management. So now I'd like to welcome, I'm very happy to welcome, Kate Cooper. So thank you, Stuart, and hello to everybody. And that was such a splendid introduction. I hope I don't disappoint anybody living up to that description that Stuart gave of me. But as Stuart said, I have spent my whole career studying leadership and management, practicing leadership and management, thinking about leadership and management, and helping other people to develop their leadership and management. So as you can probably tell, it's a subject very close to my heart. So if we look at the next slide, please, Sebastian. Stuart thought it would be a good idea if I shared some of my own sort of career and leadership journey. So I'm Kate Cooper, obviously a big fan of black and white, as you can see here. I left university with a first degree in business and administration. I had some ideas about being an accountant and I indeed had worked as an, in an accounting firm all through my vacations at university. But whether it was the exams or whether it was the idea or impression that we had, those of you who are old enough to remember Monty Python and John Cleese and all those people might have seen that they had a sketch about how boring accountants were. And maybe in my 20s, I didn't want to join that club. So I joined the car industry. And actually, I love cars. I still love cars. I'm still interested in new models of cars. I still love testing myself as whether I recognize car models on motorways. And I think probably this was my first real experience of discrimination as I experienced it for gender. I think it was definitely being a woman in the car industry was not a sensible place to be if one had ambition. You can imagine how male dominated it was. And also when I now you know, reflect back that it was a very practical, mechanical, vocational sort of industry where there would have been not too much respect 
for academic qualifications, for studying, because it's so practical, isn't it? You cars go places, they do things. And so really, although there were so many aspects of that work I enjoyed, it was my first proper job after university, it really didn't suit me. And at the time, I wasn't calling my experience sexism or discrimination. I was just having a sense of I didn't really fit. I then moved from uh, the car industry into academia and I started teaching. And in those days, as is still probably the case, you could teach in higher education without a teaching qualification. So unlike schools where they're very strict, obviously, that you, you have learned your craft, I absolutely learned my craft on the job. And I, it was to me, it was like going home. I absolutely loved teaching, being with students, thinking about organizations and thinking about how we make them better, how we do things better. And so I got very involved with part-time education for people who were working. They had real jobs and they used to come to the university to study in the evenings. And you can imagine how nice that was as a teacher, as an academic, because these people were really committed to their studying, to thinking about their practice as leaders and managers. And so for 20 odd years, I was a leadership scholar and a leadership teacher. I then left the uh, academia to join the Institute of Leadership and Management, a professional body. And whereas I'd always I felt been very close to practice, it was people who were interested in academic qualifications. And the Institute of Leadership and Management was part of City and Guilds and probably had much more in common in many ways with the with the car industry because the focus was so much on vocational, on the practical, on the doing, on the getting better in the moment, very pragmatic. So all of those have obviously influenced me, but I think if, if you think, if there is a recurrent theme that you've been looking out for, it's how much I think leadership is about getting things done, making things work and improving organizations. And I'm going to talk about what I think about improving organizations uh, in, in the next few slides. So if we can go on, Sebastian, to the next one. What I've learned about leadership in all those years of, of writing, studying, teaching, thinking, if you like, commentating, as Stuart said, um, quite a lot of commentary on, on BBC Radio and even been on the red couch a few times for BBC Breakfast. And I think that actually. There are three things about leadership. What I will never do is, maybe because I can't, but try and define leadership in a single trite sentence, in a tweet, or in something that you can uh, make a meme about or put on Instagram. Because I actually think leadership is really quite complicated because it is so complex in how we experience it. So I've identified what I consider to be the three R's of leadership. Now that's deliberate, obviously, because we've all heard about the three R's of reading, writing, and arithmetic. And so I thought actually, yes, to, to function in an organization, to, to be serious about your leadership, to try and get better at it, there isn't just one thing you need to focus on, there are three, a bit like you know, engaging and, and flourishing, if you like, in the school system. You, it's no good if you can only read and you can't write. It's no good if you can only do sums and you can't read. So the first thing, which to me, as has been a fundamental principle that I thought if anybody is thinking about getting better at managing or getting better at leading, the place they start with is relationships. So if we can look at the next slide here. I've used a definition of relating from uh, Professor Charles Hamden Hughes, uh, sorry, Professor Charles Hamden Turner. He is a management philosopher. He's in his late 80s. He's just riveting you know to listen to if you can see him on youtube where you can get the, the subtitles absolutely really interesting guy and what he says about 
authentic relating about working with others is essentially it's what lies between people so I think in relationship if we want to think about it and understand it is we say well what lies between us what is there between us that makes that relationship if we look at the next slide I've deliberately included a bigger um, definition for those people who were more, uh, you know, if you're interested in finding out a bit more about this, because if, if you take away anything from today, thinking about how we relate to people we work with, people we lead and manage, and people we are led and managed by, I think is absolutely fundamental to to getting a bit better at it. So let's look at this a bit more closely. What do I mean when I'm talking about what lies between people? So next slide, please, Sebastian. Okay, so what I've got here is the things that lie between us when we talk to somebody. Now, invariably, these are not written down. We don't even articulate them. We don't even say them. Often we just feel them. So we're talking to somebody and we're thinking, do I trust this person? Do I trust their words? Do I trust their actions? Are they telling me the truth? Are they telling me a lie, which is, you know, the most extreme? Or are they just telling me something they think I want to hear? And that is going on unconsciously, I think, a lot of the time in, in the interaction, in that how we're relating to people. And another one that I think is often forgotten, but absolutely crucial, I think, if you want to make a career in leadership and management, think about kindness. So there we are, we're talking to somebody, we're talking to our manager, we're talking to somebody that we manage, for example, and we're thinking at the time, can I trust this person? Are they telling me, are they telling me the truth? Are they telling me lies? Are they going to do what they say they're going to do? Are they unreliable? Are they being kind to me? Are they making me feel okay? All of that is going on and nobody said a word. And what we found when I was doing lots of research, because I was head of research at the Institute of Leadership and Management, that people are so forgiving of their managers, if they think they're trying to do a good job, if they are trusted. Where the, the biggest source of uh, discontent of conflict is where managers are not trusted, where they don't do what they say they're going to do, or they appear to be working for their own agenda. They're not thinking about their teams, they're not even thinking about the organization, it's all about them. So if you're talking to a manager, somebody you, who manages you, or you're talking, as I say, to somebody you manage, you are making judgments all the time about the extent to which their agenda is a personal one, I'd suggest, and that whether they have they really got the, the interests of the team at their heart, have they got the organization's interests at heart, or actually are they only interested in themselves? So you can imagine if you're trying to have a relationship with somebody and you're actually thinking they're not they're only there for themselves. That's a very sort of different interaction that you will have when you actually, as I've said, if you think somebody is trying their best to do a good job for the organization. So relating, always thinking about the relationship and then well, we might talk about that a bit later. You know, what do you do when you're feeling that there's some level of mistrust or you're not being spoken honestly to? Is it a different sort of uh, scenario? But what I'd like everyone to think about here today is that actually, am I trustworthy? Am I being honest? And am I being kind? And if you think about that in your interactions with the people you work with, it gives you a great insight into not only your own practice, but also to what you expect of other people. So if we can look at the next one, please, Sebastian. Right, this is one, the reality. And I think this is what so often we tend to ignore in organizations because we don't like our reality. We don't like what's really going on. So it might be, actually, do you know what? People don't really trust each other around here. Or we have a product 
a product that nobody really wants to buy, or we have customers we're not really giving a good service to, or we're getting grants and we're not really getting the best use out of them. Whatever it is, I think most people in an organization have a real, really good handle, a really good understanding of what's really going on. And I think too often we're actually encouraged not to talk about our reality, but to talk about a fantasy, an imaginary fantastic organization where things are going really well. So if we can look at the next slide, uh, Sebastian, please. So the reality me might be, we, we don't get on with our colleagues terribly well, or they're irritating or annoying, or we think that they're not working hard enough. We think our customers are, are not very clever, or they don't read their emails, or they don't read the instructions, or they don't take notice of all the helpful things we've sent them. Or we might think the economy is, is pretty bleak, and actually, you know, things are not going to get better. So all of these things are really going on. And we really know, I think, what we think of our colleagues. And we, but we also know, I'm sure all of you will recognize that often it's really not safe to talk about those sorts of things. So we, we tend to actually not say them or in a particular, if we're particularly British approach, we tend to underestimate or um, actually skirt round, if you like, or not really engage with what's really going on because it's so much easier, lots of more comfortable to pretend things are better than they are. And I was talking to somebody yesterday who's, who works in the Netherlands in, in, uh, in um, Northern Europe, and they were saying there, it's much more acceptable to say what you really think than it is here in, in the UK for many of us. So what happens is we're really reluctant to really engage with the reality. It's more comfortable to, to, to put a, a positive spin on things, if you like. Or we might then engage in what I call fantasies, is where well, we really could do this if we had a lot of new colleagues and new people. Or we really could be so successful if we had new customers or we had different service users. So what we're actually trying doing is not engaging with our reality, but we're creating a new reality that's a nicer place to be. How often have you been at a meeting where there's some sort of a problem that people are finding difficult or challenging? It might even be something like GDPR or it might be not necessary legislation. It might be a difficult member of staff. And we say, well, what we'll do is we'll, we'll appoint somebody new. So we, we've got the budget for a new post. And somehow we feel that that solves the problem. We're going to get a new person in who doesn't know us, who doesn't know the business, who doesn't know the situation, and they miraculously are going to solve a problem that we've been unable to solve. And that is, again, it's very, very tempting. So if I had, you know, I've said, let's think about our relationships. Well, let's also think about what's really going on. Because the colleagues that we work with, however irritating we might find them, are our colleagues. They're the people we want to improve our relationships with. I don't think many people, if come to work, wanting to do a bad job. I don't think many people come to work thinking that actually they're going to get away with doing as little as possible. I don't think people come to work thinking, actually, do you know what? I'm not really able to do this job. I'm far too incompetent. They should give it to somebody more competent than me. That is not how we view ourselves. And that is not actually what people are doing. So the colleagues we've got are the colleagues that we need to work with. And they're the colleagues that we need to improve our relationship with. So the next slide, please. My final thing is results. Now, this is a bit controversial for those of you who have studied management for some time, because I am an advocate for measurement and not measuring at the same time. So we have a, almost a, a paradox there or a contradiction. If we look at the next slide, please, Sebastian, I've extracted here 
uh, there's six sort of aspects of an evidence-based approach. And as a former academic, as somebody who's headed at research teams, I love evidence because actually that often helps us make better decisions. So if we want to know whether something's going to work, let's go and look as somebody else has done this. If we want to listen to our customers, let's listen to a lot of our customers, not just one or two. Let's think where we're getting the information that we're making our decisions on. Is it anecdotal, i.e. is it just what, something we've heard? Or are we actually doing some due diligence? We're looking at where and who is saying these things. As a head of research, you'd expect me to be quite inquisitive about where research originates and how often people say, well, research has shown, but never tell you what research, who or where. I've seen even now, sorry, there's a question come up about whether I have hearing loss. That is really important about my credibility. So actually questioning where the information is coming from is really, really important. And we should do it all the time. But the reason I think often we don't is it, it, it takes time. It slows things down. So we have to be very aware that whatever we want to do in organizations, there is evidence, there is work out there that we could take into account. But you can see what I've also said, talked about is the importance of judgment. Because sometimes you can't measure things. How can you measure the quality of trust between two people? You could say, I could say, Chloe, how much do you trust me out of 10? And Chloe might be in 10, well, like 10, Kate, because it's quite, oh, goodness, can you hear thunder? That's quite serious. So to get a real sense of how trust, how much you trust somebody is really, it's a personal judgment, but they're not substitutes. They are both, and at the same time, something we need to engage with. I'm very suspicious, skeptical of people who say, oh, I don't, you know, I trust my gut instinct. Oh, well, fine, trust your gut instinct, but then go and look for some evidence to back up why your instinct is leading you to the right decision. So those are my, I've given 20 minutes. I hope I haven't gone on over that. I've been monitoring myself carefully. They are my three R's of leadership. The idea that it's about relationships, I think first and foremost. Oh, sorry, I haven't, done, I haven't talked about the importance of knowledge as in studying leadership. You know, there are lots of information out there and again just as I'm skeptical of people who say I rely on gut instinct I'm also skeptical when people say I have studied at the university of life as though somehow reading a book is is not a good thing to be doing uh, that, that there isn't a knowledge base about leadership and management because of course there absolutely is it's a huge amount of knowledge out there do read books do reflect on your own experience and do realize, like me, you know, this is a lifetime's work. I hope we've got questions, Stuart. First of all, uh, Kate. Thank you so much for the presentation. It was really different today because you've given much more of a general view, much more of a wider view of leadership and what the leadership role is and leadership within the workplace. I think that's really, really relevant to whether you're deaf or hearing, it's all important and all that information is so useful. It's great that you've shared that. It's really important. So I've got a few questions for you. Um, so just to let you all know, if you do want to ask any questions, please do just put it in your Q&A section or you can post it in the chat box as well. 
just let you all know, and I'll pick them up and, um, and, and, and answer the questions. Okay. So quick, Kate, first question for you is, uh, so when you finished your presentation, you were talking about the importance of learning, uh, learning leadership. So how can our audience, like where, where do they start if they want to develop their leadership skills and their leadership possibilities? Where, where would be a good place to start? Well, I, of course, although I no longer work at the Institute of Leadership and Management, I left them in the summer. I'm still a big advocate. I'm still a fellow of the Institute. So I would always say the first thing to do is go to the Institute's website because there is so much free information there about all the aspects of leadership. The Institute recognizes that, never mind my three R's, they recognize five dimensions of leadership with 49 sub dimensions. And and then there are sub sub dimensions. So there's so much to leadership and management, so much you can learn about yourself as a leader, the team, how teams work, how to understand teams, how to manage teams, loads to learn about organi organizations, how they work together, how departments fit, and then how much there is in the environment out there that affects organizations, legislation, politics. You, you, can, you can never say my work is done with learning about leadership because there is so much and it depends on where you are in your career, whether you want to concentrate on yourself on teamwork, on organisations, or indeed on the environment in which organisations operate. Thank you very much for that. That's fantastic. Very, very interesting. Myself, I find it very useful to, to use their resources. Yeah. I mean, sometimes it can be quite heavy going, but um, it's definitely very, very useful. And obviously, never forget how much is on LinkedIn Learning and in YouTube. I mean, personally, I don't know if people agree with me. I'll look for things on YouTube, and if they're longer than five or ten minutes, I think, oh, too long. But there, are, there's lots of. But going back to what I was saying about evidence-based management, do be critical about who you're listening to. You know, you've only got a limited amount of time in the day or learning time. Don't waste it on, you know, 10 top tips um, just made up by somebody on the bus on the way home from work. You know, go to reputable sites like the Institute, go to um, Chartered Management Institute, people who content, but they've quality assured it. So you're not having to do that. Fantastic. Yeah, definitely. So now we've got some questions popping up in the chat from the audience. So following from your introduction from ILM, our audience are asking, what resources do the ILM have? Specifically focusing on deaf people and how can deaf people benefit from ILM resources? Well, that, this is something that uh, okay, Stuart brought to just helping funding. Sorry. Sorry, sorry just for example, helping with finances. Yeah, this is something that Stuart and I talked about at some length when we first met uh, two or three years ago, is that actually the assumption by a lot of hearing people and hearing organisations is that people um, with hearing loss or deaf people can read. And therefore, if something's in text format, well, you know, that's almost job done. And what thanks to Stuart, thanks to Craig and other groups that we've worked with, we, we recognise that this isn't enough, you know, text isn't enough. So we experimented with much more ways of, of being inclusive in terms of, um, you know, the text on the webinars, for example, but also making the information that we do make available more accessible. So less dense text, for example, trying to take advantage. And we've always tried to do that using diagrams and summary tables rather than paragraphs of writing. So just a recognition that actually people access information in different. And I think most importantly, not to make assumptions. So what I 
encourage you to do is, is go on to uh, the Institute website that everything is in text format, but you can read it on the screen and you can feed back and let the membership team know that this is actually really quite dense or this, isn't in, this is inaccessible or I feel excluded by this material. Yeah, fantastic. So uh, that's, that's a great response. And if you're feeling like maybe something isn't accessible, an uh, audience, you're very much very welcome to just to try the materials. And if you have any problems, do contact ILM and, and give any feedback on how they can make it more accessible. You're very much appreciated. Okay. So I'd like to just go back to um, the, 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 the meat of leadership itself. A lot of deaf people uh, want to become better leaders or and encouraging deaf people to become leaders in, in general. So Kate, from earlier you were speaking about uh, discrimination within the workplace. What advice would you have to, for deaf people specifically who maybe feel a challenge uh, with with that sort of glass ceiling that's present and trying to trying to move into a more mainstream um, culture and working in an environment that isn't only deaf focused. Well, I think you can approach this problem uh, from two, uh, two levels really, and I think for too long we've encouraged people to look at it as at the micro level, like what can you do, Tom? What can you do, Stuart, to make your situation better and Personally, I think that is putting too much responsible, too much responsibility on the individual. If I use sexism as an example, it's very easy to say, oh, no, I'm not being sexist, Kate. It's just you are annoying. Or I'm not being disabling. It's just that you can't really join in. So we make it very much about the person. So I would, if you're in a organization that has any sort of inclusivity policy, you have to challenge the policies. Are they genuinely inclusive or are they over, you know, over concentrating on things like gender, on race, and actually not really thinking about inclusivity? Because my opinion is that if anyone's left out, then it's not inclusive. So there's an opportunity to genuinely challenge uh, about uh, the, the policies that exist, the written documents that say. Now, another thing one can do at that micro level is to, to have a, an ally. And that's why I think I talk about relating so much. It's not just about relating with people to, uh, to get the work done. It's also with relating and having relationships with people. So working in the organization is better. And I don't know if anybody has ever done here any sort of online dating that you write a profile about yourself and there are sites that exist where you actually don't write your own profile your friend or a friend writes a profile and it's so much easier I think to champion somebody else's rights often than your own so if, if you have those form those alliances and have allies it's always better when there's two of you rather than one and obviously three is better than two but an another thing I think that is quite important perhaps if you are a, a manager with hearing loss and is, is managing hearing people or vice versa is to actually say how can I help you as your manager do the best job that you want to do or you're able to do and to put the responsibility on the other person to help you be great. So you say, I need help in being the sort of manager that you want. I need help in being the sort of team uh, player that you want. Please tell me what it is I need to do or what works for you. So it's a negotiation. It's not what I think we do so often, and this might be, it'd be even worse for, for marginalised groups, is we guess what it is that they want or they need. And we don't actually ask them and then respond to what they've told us that they want and not then try and say, oh, we don't really want that or, or to make a judgment. What is it will make me great? 
And then similarly is to ask those very honest and challenging questions, but not from the point of view of somebody who is feeling hard done by, even if you are, is, well, what are the opportunities here? What special training is there? What access do we get to development pathways? So you're starting from the assumption that actually, of course, everybody needs development. Everybody is looking for promotion, even if that isn't actually true, you know, of the whole population. So it's asking the questions, but not in a in a way where you're genuinely interested in what the answer is. But I think ultimately, and I think this is why it's perhaps a great time for people, young people, particularly looking for work. There are probably a lot more jobs than there are talented people to do them. So your real opportunity, unless you want to you know, spend your career campaigning, is to choose an organisation that's a bit on the way to where you want an organisation to be. So you're not trying to push water uphill. You're actually, the values, the in inclusivity is not only written about, it's not only on the website, it actually happens. And those are great questions to ask at interview. Well, you say you've got an inclusivity policy. What does that mean in practice? Yeah, yeah. Thanks very much, great. So a mixture of questions now for you. Some people have been asking sort of a, a bit more of a personal question about you and your career. So I'm um, very specific around your leadership style. And, and, we'll, and we'll go back to that personal side a bit more later on, but, but for the beginning, to start off with, I'll actually just ask you whether um, I mean, lots of people have heard this question before, I assume, but I was going to ask you, your, I'd like to know your opinion on this. So thinking about group leadership and, 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 being, and management, what, what, what's the difference between that leadership style and a management style? Well, this is something I think has been created by academics and trainers to fill the first lesson of any course. Because we can all spend ages, we could do it now, or what do we think leadership is? Well, what do we think management is? And we could spend, a, and it would be an interesting discussion. But what we tend to forget when we're doing that is that definitions of what leadership is and what management is change over time. So if we went back 100 years, we'd find different, totally different understanding of what that actually means. But I think more importantly, it changes in every organisation. So if you get a chief executive who comes in and says, I think leadership is about leading from the front. That impacts and influences the organisation. So everybody, to a certain extent, thinks, oh, it's about leading from the front now. If you come get a chief executive comes in and says, I really believe in servant leadership, my job is to help you be a good leader, that permeates through the organisation. So what leaders, what good leadership is, is, is I'd call it a social construction. We're always defining what that means in the, in the organisation we work for, even at a very small level, we get a new team leader comes in or we get a new boss. We wait to find out what that they think is good. Now, I don't think the power is all with the boss at all. I think it's a it's a negotiation. But we're always interested to find out and to understand what we think good is today. And that's why I wouldn't ever encourage people agonizing over about what leadership and management is other than for the purposes of passing qualifications, because it will change where they are and where they are in an organization and where we are in terms of time. Okay, yeah. But I'm sorry, Stuart, I know love, I know people love that question. And some people are so sure that they know a manager does things right. A leader does the right thing. Now, you, 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 
how that to me is it might be helpful for some but it's quite trite isn't it and that's actually based on some work that was done in the 1970s and we keep hearing about it all the time and I think another thing to add to that is how much more attractive how much sexier leadership is the management so it's this is sometimes somehow it's got a higher status so to call somebody a manager is somehow somewhat disparaging and to call somebody a well, they're a leader is it, of course that's more marks out of 10. so let's all be cautious i suppose when we use these terms because they're so value um full definitely okay thank you very much it's a really great point Put, putting that label on people and, and you have to be very careful about about what we do say and, and, and how, what the perception of that is. Very great point. So I was going to ask you from, from your sort of uh, your research that you're doing now and, put, and you need to put your research hat on for this, this question. What's the one mistake that, that you've seen leaderships make more often than any other mistake? What's the one mistake that you see quite commonly happen? I think that the, 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 the first, the cardinal sin, especially people in their first leadership role, they think they're in charge. That people are going to do what they say, miraculously, a bit like a Roman emperor, make it so. And actually, how often do we think we've given somebody an instruction it doesn't happen. And they come back to a sense, oh, I didn't understand, or oh, I thought you meant, or oh, I was confused, or so-and-so said you didn't want that, you wanted this. That our power in, in as individuals in organization to actually not do what we are directed to do is quite significant. And I think when you're a new in role as a manager, you forget how subversive people are able to be and how they're actually able to stop your great intentions and your ambitions. So I think to remember it's a negotiation right from the beginning and you're not anywhere near as in control as you'd like to be or as, as you think you are. And if you start from that, that we've got to make sure there is a shared understanding of what we're trying to achieve, that they've got to tell me what a good manager is, because you can't be a good manager if all of your team say you're not. Well, I mean, you know, that's quite a good question, but I'm a great manager. It's just my team. They're useless. Going back to what I was saying about the reality, so you you're really only as good as the, as, as the team you manage think you are. And we had a, a meeting with the companions at, at the Institute of Leadership and Management, the great and the good. And one of them actually said, I used to think I was a good leader. And then I moved to another organization and I thought, no, I'm not. So not only is it constant work, it's a reminder that we, we don't have as much um, control as we'd like to think we are. And we really need to ask people what they want from us in order for us to be good. Yeah, okay. Thank you very much. A final, a final general question. And then, but then we'll be on to the more personal section. I mean, because I mean, people are very interested in you, obviously, and there's a lot of these questions coming up about you more, about your experience. Um, so the last general question is, so what do you think the big challenge is that's facing leaders today? What is the biggest challenge? Being allowed to lead in the organizations that we all work in. I think the, um, for example, procurement, buying stuff is becoming increasingly regulated and controlled by the procurement department. How we relate to a large extent or even recruit is being controlled by the HR department. And of course they like to standardize things. So they're like a job description that's generic and you just, you know, delete where applicable. So. And at the same time, we're being encouraged to lead, to be creative, to be innovative. 
And we're actually designing organizations to a large extent that inhibit that. And I think that the big challenge for young people going into leadership today and they've got, you know, because nobody's going to be able to retire, are they? So they'll be working for the next 50 or so years is to how do I create an environment where people are allowed to have a, some autonomy, allowed to do the best, be the, their best selves, but also um, comply with all the regulations that we have to, especially if you, you know, with GDPR, I mentioned already, or financial service regulation, we are very, very regulated in the UK. And that actually is, is a protection and a constraint. So I think the, and of never mind the fact that things change, you know, when, when you least expect them. So I think building a, a climate where people understand they don't know it all and they've always got to engage in learning and that things are not going to stay the same, but it's okay, we're all right because we know how to adapt. I think that is almost, as I say, you know, it's almost an impossibility. But I think even recognizing that actually we're trying to often manage things that are contradictory or almost mutually exclusive. And we have to, as leaders and managers, make some sort of sense of it and not give up. So there's in if you want to get better at leadership, don't give up. <laughs> Definitely. Okay. So now more questions focused on you. Good. Thank you, everybody who's asking them. So thinking about your, your earlier years and your early, like your career journey, what's the one thing that you wish someone said to you earlier in your career? Don't think you're in charge, Kate. Um, I think that would, I, I think, slow down and build the relationship. I think I'm, most of us will actually be more concerned. It's almost an either or. Do we want to get the job done? Or do we want to work on the relationships? And it's it, many of you will have seen this. It's a sort of task versus process. So do we do we care about completing the tasks or do we care about the people we work with? Now, of course, there's no point just coming to work and treating it like a big group therapy session and never getting anything done. But if you only come to work to do the task and get the job done, you people won't learn and you will lose them. So I think being, as I look back, very task focused, if somebody had said to me, you know, slow down, Kate, about the task, think about the relationships, work with people, work on building that trust and, and being able to be honest. Because I think, especially when you're new in, into an organization or new into the job market, you don't think you can really bring your full self to work. So you ha actually are always sort of compromising or hiding things. So I think working at being able to have conversations with people that are authentic, but not bearing your soul. So I, it's really back to, I think, Stuart, if I had to say, you know, spend a lot of time on relationships. Be honest with people, ask them what they want and, and be able to tell them what you want from them. Bit of a recurrent theme there, isn't there? Yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. OK. Final question. This is from our audience, actually. So one audience member said that when they were at university, more than they learned about, they learned a lot about, about different leadership styles. What would you say your style is? I am an aspirational servant leader. Now, if, if those of you are familiar with, with servant leadership, it was actually rooted in a quite strong Christianity roots, but it's been adapted over time and it's, the, the idea is that you come to work to help people do a good job because altogether you are trying to do something good. So there is a higher purpose for the organization. So it might be, 
keeping customers well fed it might be making customers in ensuring customers have a good time it doesn't have to be you know we want to stop global warming or something but there will be something that we all think that we're doing together and it's the role of the leader to help people play their role in that so that actually involves putting yourself second and it so leadership isn't about me. It's not about, you know, for so long, I think we've thought about leadership as a, a collection of personal attributes be, with charisma being in there. And actually, you sort of take your personal attributes wherever you go. And as long as you have a vision that you can communicate to people, then actually, you know, happy days. What a good leader. But of course, that isn't it, because how good you are as a leader is absolutely about the people you lead. And that is what I always try to bear in mind. It's, it's not about me. It's about them. But if we think about organisations, if we think about the way we get promoted and we get jobs, it is it's, it's as an individual, is it not? So I think we always have that tension of trying to make ourselves look good in terms of our own careers, but genuinely recognising that we wouldn't look good, that, you know, the, the further up hierarchies you go, if you didn't have great people. So I think if, if I could sum that up, it's, it's recognising you're only as good as the people that you're leading and, and keeping hold of that would be my style. But as I say, it's always aspirational. It's always a work in progress because none of us is perfect and often we get it wrong. And I think, you know, if there was another lesson for, um, for, for leaders, for would-be leaders, is about owning your mistakes it's just saying, sorry, that one's on me, rather than spending a long time trying to demonstrate it wasn't your fault, it was somebody else's. So you know, taking responsibility for, for what you genuinely have messed up. And again, you know, going back to the research I've done over the years, that is so admired and appreciated by people in organisations, you know, owning up to your own mistakes and your own shortcomings. Yeah, yeah. You really got me thinking about other questions that I'd like to ask you. Um, because some of our only audience are still are still wondering what, what can the workplace be doing to how do I word this? To, to, to make the roles more accessible to deaf people within the workplace. So with your leadership style, it's a lot more about encouraging people to think. And, and, and I would say for deaf people, then maybe they need to look at who their managers are uh, in the workplace. And if they feel that that manager's that they can't change that manager's mind and that they're not uh, supportive enough, that they should be maybe moving to another organisation or looking for the organisations that will support them. I absolutely agree with, I think one of the things, the good things that's happened about COVID is the use of online has obviously increased significantly. And people are looking to recruit in different and more imaginative ways. I think there is definitely going to be a talent shortage. And we have had so many inclusivity agendas um, being, being very important that actually it's now legitimate to ask people what they are doing about all manner of excluded groups. So I think, it, you know, it, it's the time is coming, even if the time isn't actually arrived. And the other thing I think people have to remember is that actually, if you want a pay increase, if you want to get on in, the career, in your career, the best advice you can be given is to keep moving companies. People who stay in the same organisation, even if they get promoted, will not achieve the same um, salary increase, for want of a better word, than those that move. So you can move, and especially if you are from an underrepresented group, it is okay to say, I was only there a year because, you know, I could see that I wasn't going to progress as quickly as I wanted to or whatever. It's okay to do that. 
I think now with with much more remote working, with people not having to do big commuting or a, a much acceptance of that, it, if you don't like where you are, and I've always believed that, you can't change organisations. You can only take yourself out of it. Which isn't to say that you shouldn't campaign or you shouldn't, you know, you shouldn't keep working at your, at your own inclusivity agenda, but don't sacrifice your own progress in your career. Because actually, just by moving, just by going on, you're a fantastic role model. Yeah, definitely. Thank you very much. OK. So um, I think that's it for now. I think I'd like to finish uh, today. Before we conclude everything, do you have any final words you'd like to share with the audience? I, I suppose the only, the only thing I can say, and this is perhaps I will apologize in advance for my language, but I can remember saying to somebody a few years ago, because gender was is, is my campaign and I've been trying to, campaign for gender inclusivity all my um, career. And it annoys people, it pisses them off. And I have been pissing people off because of my commitment to gender inclusivity all my career. The, not all the time and every day, of course, but often challenging people about their lack of inclusivity or their own prejudice is uncomfortable. It's not only uncomfortable for the person, but it's uncomfortable for the person who's doing that challenging. And so every uncomfortable challenge you make, I'd say congratulate yourself for doing that because there's, there's a bravery about that and there's a courage about that. I'm not suggesting, I, I hope I haven't been, um, you know, a, a one, um, what do you call it, you know, one trick pony where I have only ever talked about that. A lot of the time I've just got on with the job, but it's always been there. And I have always sought to, to, to talk, call out things where I think they really offend my own values. And I think, to be honest, it's probably easier today to do that but not that much easier. It's a bit easier than it was 30 years ago, but it, it still remember to congratulate yourself when you do it because you are, you know, you're trailblazing and you are doing good work. And when you get to the stage in your career that I am at, you can look back and you can be proud of some of the things you've done. Maybe even think you you should have done more, but without any, without discomfort, I don't think there'll be any real change. Yeah. So, um, for example, like that classic saying, where uh, if, if we said it was too hard to go to the moon, we would have never gone. So that, that taking that leap forward. Absolutely. Yeah. OK, thank you very much. Well, Kate, it's been really lovely to catch up with you today. Um, and I really hope that we can do this again. Um, in, in the future. Uh, so thank you all for coming. Thank you for coming and thank you for sharing your thoughts about leadership in general and, and for sharing your, your advice to, to all my colleagues in the deaf community. Thank you for inviting me. I feel genuinely honoured that I've been included in this. So I so appreciate it. And I hope you know, if, if I've made you think anybody just a little bit, I'll feel well, well done me, you know. <laughs> That's the extent of my ambition, just to give people some things to think about. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you very much, very much, Kate, for, your, uh, for today. So I'm going to conclude and close the this session. I'd like to thank everyone for watching. If you stay on for a little to the end, um, you might be able to find out who's coming for the next session uh, for, for, via a short video. Thank you very much.